Hello, welcome to Dissident Daughters Podcast. I am Ada, and I am flying solo today, which makes me feel a little exposed and vulnerable, but here we go. Um, I have uh, been interviewing my kids the last couple weeks. I've, I've posted those podcasts. I am still planning on interviewing my third child, uh, but she has a super busy life and doesn't live with me. So it's a little bit more complicated to get her on, but we will eventually because she's got um, some great stories to tell as well. So today uh, I just wanted to talk about a couple things that are just been on my mind lately. I am literally sitting in my closet. <laughs> it's hot as hell in here. <laughs> But it's the only place I can go where I'm all by myself. And uh, hopefully it's quiet and we don't get interrupted. But uh, today is the last day of school. My uh, Jezebel that we interviewed a couple weeks ago, she is graduating high school today. There is just a lot going on in our household. So this last week, I went to brunch with a friend who I actually didn't know very well before um, this podcast. And she found my podcast and she reached out to me because she recognized my voice. Now, <laughs> I've been using not my real name because I, you know, in all honesty, uh, both Esther and I decided that we just weren't ready for our families to know that we were, they know we're out of the church, but we didn't want them to know that we were talking out about the church because we felt like it would be very hurtful to them and they would, they would struggle with that. And also we wanted to feel like we were free to talk about whatever we wanted to talk about without having to filter any of it, any of our thoughts or any of our feelings or our past experiences, filtering it to try to, um, I guess, protect our, our, our family members that maybe we were speaking about. And that does get really tricky. And I've had some moments of feeling really sad about the fact that maybe I'm um, betraying them in some way or that I'm that, you know, that someday they might stumble across this podcast and feel sadness and grief about what I'm sharing. Um, but I also feel like it's important to tell my story. I've always felt really strongly uh, about telling the truth. And that's, that's something that was instilled in me because of the gospel, right? Because of the things we're taught in the church and that the, the truth is so important. And the fact that we were always taught that we belonged to the one true church and Joseph Smith was a true prophet and, you know, our current prophet is a true prophet and, and all this, all this stuff, that word was thrown around a lot. And, and I took it very seriously and it mattered to me a lot. And so I think therefore that is one of the reasons why my faith crisis was so harmful and, and painful for me. Uh, I was reading an article this week. Um, this is really interesting. If you want to look up, it's called, um, one cool trick. I think, uh, it's by thoughts on things and stuff. <laughs> um, so you can look them up, but he talks about how the level of commitment, a faith crisis is like the intensity of a faith crisis depends on the level of commitment. So someone who's in a religion, and is not maybe uh, fully engrossed in it, or maybe they are skeptical of it, or maybe they're just a little bit uncommitted. They're not sure. They maybe don't adhere to the rules very strictly. Uh, they don't maybe just feel a really strong testimony of it, I guess is the best word to use. They are going to react to a faith crisis very differently than someone who is completely devout, uh, deeply committed and, you know, strictly adheres to all the rules, dedicates their life, you know, does all the things that they're supposed to do because they feel so strongly about the truth of it. They just have a deep personal commitment and their identity is wrapped up in the faith, right? That person is going to have 
a much stronger, like life shattering faith crisis, right? And that's where I would describe me because I was fully believing. And it's so interesting because when I was in the church, I always had this uh, opinion of people who left that they were never really committed to begin with, that they really weren't that serious about it, that, you know, maybe they just never really had a testimony or they never really felt the spirit. And I always thought, you know, if you've had lots of spiritual experiences, how can you explain those away and leave the religion? Well, when you recognize that spiritual experiences are, you know, manipulations of your emotions a lot of times, um, it's actually very easy to explain those away. And, and I've heard, you know, arguments from family members like, how can you, how can you just discount all the spiritual experiences you, that you had? And now I can say, well, those spiritual experiences were really profound for me and I felt a strong emotion about them, but they didn't confirm the truthfulness of the gospel. That's not what it was about. Most of the time, those emotional experiences had something to do with uh, something, you know, very profound and, and emotional or a moral, you know, a story with like a strong moral theme to it, um, things like that, where, you know, I was feeling emotion because I had empathy and I had love and I had, you know, those other good things that that, that you feel. And that doesn't equate to the church being true, even though that's what they taught us, right? So when you're taught that, you know, every time you feel an emotion and start to cry at church that, oh, that's a spiritual experience telling you the church is true. Well, actually it's not. So that's, that's one of the things that I kind of get, you know, thrown at me from family members and friends. But back to my original, sorry, I'm kind of like going off topic here, but uh, I went to brunch with this friend. She reached out to me. I had only had a few interactions with her uh, before she found the podcast and she actually knows Esther as well. And she said, hey, I found you guys. And we were um, shocked and a little bit, uh, stressed out about it because we're like, oh no, we're caught, we're found, we are exposed here. And, um, and, and then, we, you know, we kind of just had to laugh about it because there's not really a lot we can do. Uh, but we are trying to, you know, tell our stories in an authentic and, uh, real way so that hopefully it can help other people who are, you know, have gone through or are going through similar things. So this particular friend, has been going through her faith crisis and is, you know, a little bit newer to this than we are. And my interview with my daughter Jezebel uh, was very emotional for her. And she reached out to me and just told me, thank you so much for it and, and how much it meant to her and that she wanted to talk more about it, more about uh, how to talk to your kids about things and, and how to talk to your parents. We ended up talking about how you know, she could talk to her parents about her faith crisis. And so through that whole, I mean, we had a three hour brunch and it was beautiful and wonderful. And I, I now consider her a dear friend. Uh, she's going to love that I'm talking about her in this episode. <laughs> um, but she, she had a very similar upbringing. I mean, she told me her whole Mormon story. And it's just so funny because I hear so many stories now and they're all so similar. You guys, we all went through so many of the same things and, um, have shame in the same areas and have indoctrination that is really hard to untangle and to work through. So one of the things that we ended up talking about and that I've been thinking about ever since then is how do you explain what you've been through to a faithful LDS person? And, and usually the, the ones that are the hardest, I believe, are the people closest to you, right? Your parents, your kids, your spouse, your best friends, your siblings. These are hard conversations. And, and, and how do you explain what you've been through so that the other person can understand and validate you without feeling defensive, right? This, I think this is the trickiest thing that there is in going through this process is when you have a crisis in your life, okay? Anything, a death, a job loss, a divorce, a, a, a 
a serious illness, a whatever, you need the people around you to rally around you to give you validation to say, you know, things like you're not broken or I hear you and I understand you and I know where you're coming from. And these things, for, for whatever reason, I, th I think all of us just, we need to feel heard. And it's, and it's extremely important to our healing, right? It's just to feel like we are being heard, we are being validated, we are being understood. Even if the person doesn't agree with us, it's so healing to just have someone say, wow, that must have been incredibly difficult and I'm so sorry that that's what you've been through. So one of the biggest problems in communicating this faith crisis with believing family and friends is that what happens instead of that is that the person immediately feels defensive, like they need to defend their belief and their testimony, and they end up completely dismissing us or gaslighting us saying, oh, it was never that way, that was never taught, or that never happened to me, or, you know, nobody's, nobody ever had that happen, you know, just completely dismissing it. In fact, I have an example of this. I was in a conversation with a, a girl, a young girl, maybe 20 years old, who had just come back from her mission. She was on her mission for about five months, and because of her mental health, and struggles that she had on her mission, she came home early. Now, this girl is really struggling with her faith. And we haven't had deep conversations about this, but she has shared a little bit with me, right, about how she's struggling. And then in also in the room was another person who is closer to my age, who is fully believing in the church, who is a return missionary, yada, yada, right? Well, we, we weren't talking about or bagging on the church at all. She just simply shared an experience about her mission where she went to a coastal city and uh, where she was very close to the beach all the time. And I said, oh my gosh, was that so hard because you know you can't enjoy the beach at all and and uh, other people, it's like a, a, a great vacation spot, you know, where lots of people go to vacation. And she said, yeah, she said, we couldn't even go and touch the sand. We couldn't even, we couldn't even touch, come up to the sand. And, uh, and then she also mentioned that the elders, that only sisters got called to this specific area near the beach because uh, her mission president told her that, you know, elders had a harder time when they would see girls in bikinis or, you know, other things like this. And also that, of course, I mean, and not everybody has had this experience, but I think the vast majority of people would laugh and agree that we were always taught that Satan ruled the water, right? And so I made like this tiny little joke about, you know, if you get too close to the water, then Satan has control over you. Well, this other guy who is a fully believing Mormon, he completely jumps on this and starts discounting this young girl's experience and struggles with being with being there and 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 what she said about her mission president saying that he wouldn't call elders to that area because it was too much of a temptation to see girls in bikinis. He said that didn't happen. That is not the reason. That is not why they don't call elders there. And that is not why they say you can't go in the water. And he starts saying, do you know how many missionaries have drowned? And I was like, are you serious? Like, this is not the reason that... <laughs> It just made me laugh, but he immediately felt defensive and he immediately dismissed this young girl's experience. And this is a common thing that happens when we are talking with fully believing Latter-day Saints. They feel defensive. They don't do it because they're terrible people. They don't do it because they're mean and heartless and have no empathy. No, they do it because they have constantly been told to defend their faith. And they have indoctrinated themselves and brainwashed themselves into like completely dismissing anything that doesn't make them feel warm fuzzies. And they're just conditioned in all of these ways. 
And so we get excuses thrown at us about all the issues and they love to explain away all the things that that's just not a big deal. It's just a matter of faith. It's, it'll all be worked out in, in heaven or after we die, God will let us know all the things. We just have to wait on the Lord's timing and yada, 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 right? I'm sure all of you have heard these excuses or these uh, explanations for all the issues that we have, right? Oh, oh, my favorite one is uh, that it's a test. <laughs> that God, you know, like this in, in particular to like um, archaeological evidence of the Book of Mormon, it's like there's no archaeological evidence because God is testing our faith. What a crock of shit. That is... <laughs> That is the most ridiculous. I mean, God is just a real asshole. He's just really trying to, you know, make it as hard as possible for us to believe stuff, you know. And and if he shows us evidence, then it's just too easy for us to believe. So he's not going to do that, right? I mean, this kind of stuff is so ridiculous. When you really break it down and talk about it and like think critically about these things it's just ridiculous the the lengths that people will go to try to justify and excuse and the mental gymnastics required is just to to believe after you know all these things is just insane it's just it's like a level that is you know like olympic style uh gymnastics it's just it's just bad so with this friend, you know, during brunch, we were talking about she's struggling to know how to talk to her parents because she really, like, they know that she's not going to church and, and maybe that she's not really believing anymore, but they have not given her any sort of validation and understanding about what she's been through. Because it's not just a small thing. A faith crisis for a lot of people is earth shattering and completely life changing. And, and I, and I understand it, you know, as she's telling me this, I'm like, yeah, I know exactly how that feels because one of my very dearest siblings who is still fully believing in the church has never once asked me if I'm okay. He has never once asked me what happened or asked me to talk to him about why I left or what happened or, you know, has never said to me that he's sorry or that he, he feels bad or that he understands that I've been through something really hard. Like it ends up, and I think this is so prevalent, it ends up being the thing we don't talk about, right? In our families, we, we end up having our faithful family members ignore it, ignore the huge elephant in the room that is such a significant part of our life experience, but they pretend it's not there. And that is so, so, so hard because I think it really drives a wedge that you can't, your relationships are never the same. It's, it's so incredibly difficult to, to just ignore the elephant in the room, I guess is just the best way to say it. Like it's this constant battle of trying to pretend like everything's fine. And, and I would say that my relationship with this brother is otherwise really wonderful. Like I love and adore him and his entire family. And, and yet there's just this sadness in me that he doesn't fully understand the gravity of what I've been through. In the last few years and therefore there is a piece of our relationship a closeness in our relationship that can never be there because he's unwilling to give it the space to talk about it because it's uncomfortable and I think this is one of the big things that we this is one of the biggest things that we have to deal with as we leave the church is dealing with the uncomfortable conversations a lot of times feeling like we have to tiptoe around our faithful family's, you know, uh, feelings and to not hurt them and to, you know, still do our people pleasing because that's so ingrained in us. Like we, we know that we are in charge of everyone else's emotions and feelings about all of it. Right. So 
So I think this is the big challenge. And I think one of the ways that I have tried to deal with it is to be, to try to put myself in their shoes, right? Because it's easy for us to do that. We've been in their shoes. Like that's, that's not a stretch at all for us to try to imagine how they feel, right? Our, our faithful, still believing family members. So, but the problem is they can never put themselves in our shoes. That's, that's really, really, really difficult. If somebody can do that, that's surprising, right? And it's, it's way more rare, but it's fantastic if they can, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the goal right there is for both of you to be able to understand each other. But I think we have to talk to them in a way that does not feel threatening, if that makes sense. So we have to be able to, you know, help them to logically look at things um, or to understand your perspective by, by explaining your experience. I think to be able to say, this is my experience and this is how it felt. And I never wanted the church to not be true. I only ever wanted this to be true. And then when I learned the things that I learned, it was soul crushing and devastating. And it, it changed everything. And I can no longer just pretend. I can't go back to something that used to feel so beautiful and wonderful to me because now I know that it's not beautiful and wonderful for me. And I think that's really difficult to do. I, I don't I don't know what the secret is. If if anybody has like a great secret on this to share, hey, I am all ears. Uh, I would love to hear what your experiences are. But in my experience, I think gentle honesty has been really healing. I have really tried to uh, tell the truth with my family members and be honest with them. But I also, you know, like I mentioned, my brother, like he's never brought it up to me and I'm not going to bring it up to him because he clearly doesn't want to talk to about, talk about it. But in the situations where my mom has actually been very loving and very accepting and really truly has wanted to understand, which is beautiful. Um, I have to give my mom huge props for that because I know that that hasn't been easy for her. She is fully, fully believing and her entire life is dedicated to the gospel. And I don't think that that can ever change for her. But at the same time, I truly know how much she loves me because of how much she really has tried. And I, and I know that it's been really hard for her to understand. And there was one conversation in particular that we had where she, she said, something about Joseph Smith. And I just, you know, that just kind of opened up a can of worms. And I started talking about all the things with Joseph Smith and all of my problems with him. And that definitely started putting up some defenses for her. And she started making excuses and, and saying, you know, justifying this and that and the other thing that I was saying. And it just got me so fired up. I was I was so mad. By the time I left that conversation, I literally was just like, there is no hope. No one will ever listen to me. No one will ever understand what I've been through. I felt so alone and so dismissed, so completely dismissed and devastated. And it took me about six months before I had another conversation with my mom. I mean, obviously I had other conversations with my mom, but not about this issue, right? We just kind of left it and ignored it. And then the next time I talked to her, I told her, you know, that conversation that we had, uh, I said, that was a devastating conversation to me. And she said, oh, really? Why? Like, I thought that was a great conversation. <laughs> And so it's so interesting to see like somebody else might have a completely different experience than what you are experiencing. Right. And, uh, I just had to kind of laugh at that. She's like, I thought it was great. Like we, I thought we cleared the air about all the stuff. And I was like, no mom, we didn't, we didn't clear the air. You made excuses. You made excuses for Joseph Smith and you made it sound like it's just fine that he was a predator and that he was a fraud and that he made it all up. It's fine because, because God gave him a, a job and he did it. And yes, he wasn't perfect. And this was my mom's talking, right? It's like, but he was still called of God and, and he wasn't perfect. And, and he had lots of flaws, but he did the best he could, right? With what he had. 
And honestly, I wanted to say to her, I'm sorry, you cannot claim to be a prophet and speak for God when you are such a royal fuck up, right? Like there's just, it's, it's just maddening to me that people are buying this bullshit. Like, like, is God going to pick the absolute worst human being on the planet to restore his church? No. I'm sorry. That's not how God works. That's not how any of this works. I refuse to accept that as an explanation. But, of course, I didn't say any of that to Mom. I just said, you know, that that conversation was devastating to me and that I felt completely dismissed. And I said, Mom, it's fine if you... I don't want to put you in a place of feeling like you have to defend the gospel and you have to defend Joseph Smith. So I think it's better that we just don't talk about it. But can you please, for the love of God, stop making excuses. Please stop making excuses. When somebody says to you, this is hurtful, this is harmful, this is bad, this is my experience, and it was terrible. Do not say, oh, but that's what God wanted, or oh, he was just doing the best he could, or oh, that's, you know, we don't know about that, but we'll find out someday. Like, those are the excuses and and the explanations that are so Oh my gosh, they just make me so mad. So just what I said to my mom is we don't ever have to talk about the church again. And I'm not going to try to convince you of anything, but please stop making excuses for bad behavior. There is bad behavior everywhere in the history and in the current church. Completely terrible bad behavior. And do not make an excuse for it. And she said, okay. And she agreed to that. And I actually felt really good after that conversation because I just said, I can't handle you making excuses and trying to justify the bad behavior. But if we can just decide, you know, agree to disagree, basically, because I'm never going to change her mind. I think that's the trap that we fall into a lot of times when we talk to our believing family and friends is that we think in our minds that we're going to change them, that we're going to make them think something different, that we're going to share something that is going to be life-changing for them and and is going to change their mind. But that's not what happens. I I would say 99% of the time, it's actually the backfire effect. And what happens is they double down on their belief and it, it draws, it puts a wedge in your relationship. So this friend of mine, she said that she talks to her mom every single day. And yet there's this giant elephant in the room and it's almost worse. The fact that she talks to her every day because it, it now like all this time has passed since they stopped going to church. I think she said about a year ago and (laughs) all this time has passed and now it's even more awkward to talk about it. Right. And so, you know, it's not like I have perfect advice about that, but I completely understand it, right? I, I bet there's so many people who listen to this who go, oh yeah, that's exactly what I experienced, you know? And and how do we bring it up and how do we talk about it? And I just think, you know, baby steps, maybe trying to understand the other person and like look at it from their perspective, uh, trying not to get too dug in our heels about wanting to be heard so that we do dismiss the other person, I think that's really important. There has to be validation on both sides. If we want to be validated and understood and listened to, then we also need to provide that for the other people that we're talking to, right? So I think just being patient with yourself, taking baby steps towards communication, open lines of communication, telling the truth, being brave. It's sometimes really hard, I think, especially for women to be brave and to speak their truth because we are always taught that we have to care about everyone else's feelings before our own, right? And we have to make sure that everyone else feels comfortable and happy with what we're saying. And we don't want to, we don't want to ruffle feathers and we don't want to cause contention and all of these things. And so I'm not saying that you have to go out uh, in a blaze of glory and and act like a complete bull in a china shop and, and start flipping tables everywhere you go. No, that's, that's completely outside side of our, you know, the realm of, of who we are, right? And who we've been trained to be. So it's it's really difficult to just suddenly become a different person, right? And, and we don't necessarily want to, but we can take small steps towards sticking up for ourselves when we see that it is necessary, standing up for what we believe in, telling the truth, being uh, authentic and real with people, trying, it's its very difficult, but we need to try not to get defensive about things. And we need to, we don't have to prove to anyone, you know, we don't have to prove anything to anyone and we don't have to explain our reasons 
for leaving to anyone if we don't want to, right? We just have to like our reasons for leaving. That's it. If we like our reasons for leaving, that's enough. Nobody else has to like our reasons, right? And so I think that's really important too. Uh, the last thing I was going to say about that, in the church, we're always taught that there's like a right way and a wrong way, right? There's there's good and bad. It's black and white, right? And so one of the things when I left the church, I was very adamant that I was going to do it right. <laughs> I was going to leave the church right. I was going to, I don't know, like I had this idea that other people who left the church, they did it wrong. <laughs> I had this idea that people just kind of like fell off the face of the earth. They stopped talking to people. They, they, they like, what's the word? Like they hid from everyone in their, in their congregation, in their ward or in their neighborhood that was LDS. They would just like turn their head. They would stop waving when you walked past or they would, they would stop interacting with you on social media and all these things because they were just kind of going into their own selves and hiding. And I always thought that that's what they were doing. And so in my mind, I was like, you know what? I'm going to talk to all the people. I'm going to say, hi, I'm going to be the most, you know, vibrant, happy person. And I'm going to, when I see them at the grocery store, I'm going to go up to them and ask them about their lives and say, how are you doing? Instead of like turning the other way and crossing the aisles so that you don't have to see them and pretend like you don't know them. Like I have gone out of my way to be extra friendly to all the people in my neighborhood and in my city and everything. Everybody that I know is, is Mormon. I'm just like, I don't know. And, and in my mind, that was the right way to do it. Right. Right. In, in air quotes. And what my therapist told me is like, that's your Mormon brain thinking. That's, that's the way you've been taught is that there's a right and a wrong way. Right. And guess what? There is no right way to leave the church. People do the best they can do with what they know and how they feel and, 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 and who they are. Right. And I think you just take it a day at a time. You just do what feels the most true and right and, and authentic to you. And, and you, and you take baby steps. You do what feels the best to you. And I think that's when people will see that you are being your true, most authentic self. You aren't, I guess, like trying to fit in a mold anymore. You aren't trying to be something you're not anymore. And people will recognize that. Uh, in fact, the last conversation I had with my mom, this was not the conversation where uh, I told her, you know, not to give excuses for the church anymore, but this was our most recent conversation and it was wonderful. We literally talked for hours, just her and me. And she said to me, I can see that you're through the hardest part of your faith crisis. And I can see that you are just lit up and that you are doing so well. And that felt so good. Like that made my heart almost completely leap out of my chest because that's all I wanted, you know? It's it's all I've wanted is just to have somebody recognize what I've been through and validate how that is and see that I am happy on the other side and that I am thriving and doing well. And it just felt so incredibly good. So so yeah, I that's one thing I I can say my mom has done the best that she knows how and it hasn't been perfect. Uh, because she she hasn't ever experienced this before. This this has been really difficult for her. In fact, you know, most of her kids have now left the church, and it's all been in the last few years. And it's been alarming, and it's been devastating. And she has blamed herself. That's another thing we need to think about when we are talking to our parents about our faith crisis. They take it personal. They think that it's a failure on their part, that they didn't do enough to teach us. And I know this because I felt this. When my son left the church, when he was 14 or however old, I felt like I was a complete failure, right? Because that's our number one goal. That's our number one job is to teach our kids the gospel and to keep them on the covenant path, right? And then when they don't want to be on the path, it's like, what did I do wrong? And so when you're talking to your parents, keep that in mind that they are feeling their own feelings. Now, you can't control their feelings. You're not in charge of their feelings. They get to feel however they want, right? But you can very clearly and honestly explain to them that you are a fully adult human with your own brain and that they taught you to 
think for yourself and that that's a beautiful thing and that they did everything they were supposed to do and they are not failures because you are an independent, thriving, smart adult. And if they think they're a failure, <laughs> you know, and you can even point out, like, if you think you're a failure because of looking at me, how, <laughs> how painful do you think that is for me, right? <laughs> like, no, they aren't failures for the fact that you've left the church. In fact, you know, having an obedient child is not as good as having a thinking for themselves, smart, happy child. And so sometimes maybe they need to have that pointed out to them in, in the most kind way, obviously, but just keep in mind that they do, they do tend to take your leaving the church as a personal thing, uh, as a personal failure of theirs, right? So, so those are my thoughts for today. I wanted to share one other thing that I actually, uh, I had kind of forgotten about this, and this is something that I wrote um, at the very beginning of my faith crisis. So I need to find it here quick. So I've kind of kept a blog like through my whole faith journey and crisis and all of this stuff. And uh, I've gone back and read some things that I've really, I just laugh at now. But uh, this is something that I've, I've actually wanted to share in previous episodes, but we never got around to it. So I'm going to share it now. So I had this idea bumping around in my head for a while uh, early on in my faith crisis. And so it took me a while, but I, like, I kept thinking about it and having, so when I was on my mission and all missionaries, at least in my, in the years around the time when I went, I don't know if they still do this, but we had to memorize Joseph Smith's first vision account, like as it is in the, uh, Joseph Smith history, which we all know is, <laughs> is a mixture of about seven accounts and also somewhat just made up anyways. So we had to memorize that. So I had it memorized for many, many, many years, and I still have many parts of it memorized. So I kept having this thought bumping around in my head about writing my own First Vision account. And it's meant to be, you know, kind of lighthearted and just to kind of bring some insight into my experience. And so, you know, I, and I wanted to tell the truth, and that's been very important to my journey. So here it is, my First Vision while I was laboring under the extreme difficulties caused by the information I was learning about my church's history, I was one day reading the CES letter, which explains how the Book of Mormon was not historical, Joseph Smith was a liar, and everything he pro professed to be true was absolutely, unequivocally false. <laughs> Never did any passage of truth come with more power to the heart of a woman than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. I reflected on it again and again, knowing that if any person learned this truth, they surely couldn't be continue believing in the church. At length, I came to the conclusion that I must either remain in the church being a fraud and a phony, or I must do as I now know to be right and speak my truth. Resign from the church, which has kept me bound and in darkness and lies my entire life. I at length came to the determination to ask myself, concluding that I'm a pretty smart person and I can figure out what is total bullshit and what is truth. So in accordance with this, my determination to listen to my own heart and to learn the truth, I retired to my bed to make the attempt. It was in the evening of a beautiful clear day in the early spring of 2020. It was the first time in my life that I had made such an attempt. For amidst all the fear I had been taught my whole life about how I had to listen to the leaders of the church and do what they said, I had never as yet made the attempt to listen to my own heart. After I had retired to the place where I had previously designed to go, my bed, having looked around me and finding myself alone, I laid down and began to offer up the desires of my heart to myself. I had scarcely done so when I immediately thought I would be seized upon by some power which would overtake me and tell me that I shouldn't listen to my own gut. I just needed to listen to the brethren and they would tell me all the things I needed to do. These brethren had had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak up for myself my whole life. Thick darkness gathered around me every time I thought about going back to church, and it seemed for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction if I had to continue pretending to believe in the church I was raised in. 
but exerting all my own power to deliver me out of the hands of this enemy, which has taken over my whole life, and at the very moment when I was ready to sink into despair and abandon myself to destruction, not to an imaginary ruin, but to the power of the actual Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who had such marvelous power as I had never before known, just at this moment of great alarm, I saw within me a light above the brightness of the sun, and it had been within me all along. It no sooner became apparent to me than I found myself delivered from the enemy which had held me bound. When I allowed my light to shine, I spoke to myself and said, You are a beloved daughter of God. You don't need the church to tell you what to do and what to believe. You have learned the truth about their fraud and their lies, and now you are free to make your own choices and choose whatever path you believe is right for you. For at this time, it had never entered into my heart that the church was a fraud. I always believed it was God's true church and that Joseph Smith was a true prophet. I was answered by myself that I should leave the church, for it was completely wrong, and I realized for myself that all their creeds were an abomination in God's sight, that those so-called prophets and apostles were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach false doctrines of men, having a form of godliness or pretending to be godly, but they deny the power of my individual spirit, which tells me the truth." My spirit also told me that I would have to part ways with all the false teachings of judging others, pushing away those who are different, being self-righteous, giving all of my ties to a billion-dollar church who saves their money for a quote-unquote rainy day, while people are starving all over the world who are members of their very church. My spirit said that I cannot support a church who fights against the rights of LGBTQ people and teaches them that they are flawed. My spirit delighted in learning the truth for myself and realizing that I wasn't crazy for feeling like I didn't fit in with the people in the church. It's because the church is all a huge lie, a fraud and a fake. When I gave myself permission to listen to my own heart and mind, I felt completely free. Reading the CES letter completely validated my worries and concerns about the truthfulness of the church, and it gave me the permission I needed to leave the church. I now know that there is no going back ever, and I would never want to. I still believe in God, and I try my best to be a good person and stop trying to fit a perfect mold that supposed prophets have told me I need to fit. They've been wrong from the beginning. Organized religion is simply a way for men to get power, to manipulate and control people. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is especially guilty of this and has defrauded millions of people for 200 years. It's time for people to start speaking up and telling the truth about this organization. I will never allow myself or my family to be hurt by it again. I have learned for myself the truth, and I'm so grateful for it. So, of course, I wrote that in the summer of 2020, and... Uh, some of my feelings have changed a little bit over that time. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about God. Uh, I, I would like to believe that there is a higher uh, source of light and truth and, and energy in the world or, you know, s somewhat of, a, of an idea of God makes sense to me, but I do not believe him to be a man with a white beard, right? Obviously, uh, I've, I've mentioned that before. I, I just do not subscribe to that anymore, but I do love the idea of, a of a higher being. And so anyways, that was my first vision account, which, you know, was just kind of funny, but I, I wanted to share that to kind of hopefully give people an idea of how it feels going through this experience and, how compared to the real first vision account, <laughs> it can, it can, I think it can be pretty profound to make those comparisons. So I think that's all that I wanted to share today. I would love any feedback that you had for me. Uh, if there are certain topics that you want me to discuss or certain questions that you have, or even if you want to come on my podcast as a guest, I would love it. I have quite a few things and ideas coming up that I'm excited to share and that I want to, you know, want to make as episodes, but I still have, you know, my, I am open to any suggestions and ideas from other people and interviewing other people. I would love it so much. So uh, feel free to message me. Uh, you can comment on the actual podcast. You can reach out to me through the website, dissidentdaughters.org. We would love to have donations. 
uh, to make it possible for us to keep going with this, you can set up an automatic monthly donation of like $3. I mean, I don't even know if there is a minimum. Maybe it's $1. I don't know. But I know like just setting it up to automatically come out of your bank account and go into this fund is super easy and it's not expensive. I mean, you, you could just donate enough to get me one cup of coffee. <laughs> And I would be so grateful for it. Um, no, but I, I want, I think this work is important and I love the voices of people who are going out there and are speaking it and are opening up this world of knowledge to those who most need it. And that has been super helpful for me. So I'm just joining in and sharing my story because guess what? I, one of the things I have learned is that I get to take up space in this world too. You know, so many times we think, well, what right do I have to tell my story? Or why would anyone want to listen to me? And I know some of you have had those feelings. And I know, especially as women, we feel like we can't take up space. We can't be too big or too loud or too much for anyone. Well, guess what? We have as much right as anyone else to take up space, to speak our truth, and to be heard. So with that, I will leave you and I'll be back next time with more hopefully good things to say. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Love you all. Thanks for listening. Talk to you later. Bye.